It's incredible. It's, uh, the rhino is, you had to give him an do extra dose of the, of the drug because he's not quite, <laughs> quite down yet. But to be so close to this wild rhino that was just running free, just running five minutes ago is amazing. This is a big, horn. look at the base size of the base of that horn. It's a massive horn. It's also kind of a sad thing because this all occurs because of the poaching crisis. This, he has to go through this trauma. But uh, we'll make it as pain, pain, painless as possible. Exciting to be on the first, my first, very first rhino guardian and uh, GPS um, tracking device. This is super exciting. Welcome to the Insta Wilderness Podcast. I am your host, Byron Pace, and this is a Modern Huntsman production. I am bringing you another intro from uh, the garden of my grandmother's place in Johannesburg, South Africa, stopping here for a couple of days in between filming trips. I've just come back from the north of South Africa, um, near the border of Botswana, and tomorrow morning I get on a plane and head to Nairobi before going to um, Tanzania where I'm spending 12 or 13 days with Robin Hurt Safaris documenting some of their anti-poaching work and conservation work out there. So a lot of exciting things to come, which is my last trip in Africa before eventually I'm heading home. So I've been hustling really hard to get my admin done over the last two days, which includes recording this intro, editing the podcast and getting it out for you. You're about to hear the second episode in the series from the front lines presented by Rocky Talkie. In this series, I get in the field with people making a tangible difference to wildlife conservation on the ground. In the intro you just heard, that was the voice of artist and conservationist John Banovich. We were in the middle of a rhino tracking project in Namibia a few weeks ago, and you're about to hear an incredible conversation between myself, John, Annette Oliver, and her son, Alex, who was on the show last week. And I've had so much feedback and so much social sharing uh, from the snippets that have come off the back of that incredible conversation. John is a globally acclaimed wildlife artist, and I encourage you to check out his work on his website or on his Instagram. He was our guest editor for the African volume, which was volume eight of Modern Huntsman, and that incredible black rhino on the front cover that was painted by John. If you want to see a short doc that we created about him, head over to modernhuntsman.com. Uh, there's a film there called In Search of Africa, and that is, I think it's 12 or 13 minutes, which gives you an insight into the mind of John Banovich. It's also going to be linked in the description. Alex needs no introduction, having been on the show last week and about two years ago as well. But his mom, Aneta also, is one of the unsung heroes of conservation in Africa. She is the mother of rhinos uh, and has lived a remarkable life, um, dedicating pretty much every waking moment to the conservation of wildlife. I'm in the very final stages of finishing the full feature length documentary on her story, Paid in Blood, which you've heard me talk about before on this podcast. And it looks like everything is shaping up for us to finish that in September of this year. This has undoubtedly been one of my favorite series to put together because I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be, in the field, filming, photographing, and recording podcasts with incredible people, thanks to Rocky Talkie Radios. I've been using them in the productions this last month to six weeks while I've been here in Africa, and unlike a lot of my camera gear, uh, they have performed flawlessly. Rocky Talkies are a backcountry radio system designed by a small team in Denver the radios are extremely rugged, easy to use and compact, weighing just under eight ounces. They range, or they have a range of between one and five miles in the mountains and over 25 miles if you have line of sight. Their cold resistant batteries will last between three and five days, even at minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit, and they can be charged, very importantly for me, by USB-C. If you wanna get 10% off a Rocky Talkie radio, head over to Rocky Talkie dot com forward slash into the wilderness and the last thing before we all sit down with this amazing group of people in Annette's lounge in Namibia I have to shout out 
this week's top tier patrons who include Richard McNeil, Ronnie Speakman of RD Contracting, James Markington, the guys at South Ash Stalking, Dick Ekstrom, Mark Zabrowski, and Leslie Cumming. Thank you so much for your support. And if you would like to support these shows, head over to patreon.com forward slash Byron Pace. John, Anata, Alex, welcome to the Into the Wilderness podcast. This is an incredible privilege for me because I've spent a decent proportion of my, the last three years of my life at this place with Aneta and Alex um, filming. And John, you and I started doing some work together, I suppose a couple of years ago now, and we spent an amazing time in East Africa um, just last year. Uh, and now we're here, we're in Namibia at Aneta and Alex's place. I want to start by just recounting your experience yesterday, John, with the orphan rhinos, and then we'll get Aneta to explain how they how they came to be here. What was that like for you, sitting on the back of the back of the cruiser there with these orphan rhinos around you, given that you've painted so many? Yeah. Well, the first the f- first thing that just took me back was when Aneta communed with the rhino. So for a second, you know, the world between rhinos and humans closed, and watched that intimate, true joy and true sa- feeling of security and safety, um, which, you know, ne- neither, neither of their worlds are secure and safe, but to watch that moment of, of, of connection was, in, was profound. I feel that connection from time to time with animals as well. Um, and, I, and I think I have to have it to begin that journey, but, but um, you know, to be in the presence of these and I knew the stories going into it. These are not uh, the reason they're there is because the system's broken. System, you know, it's a it's a failed system. When I say that, meaning that you know they they have arrived because of a tragedy, and here we are. We get the privilege of having a moment, an intimate moment in their world as they begin their journey, their long struggle um, to back to the wild. But what a privilege it is to be. I have a glimpse into that journey and and that that's that's i mean you don't get those you don't get that often so that was really great that was cool was you were saying that uh it's very rare to have the opportunity to look at the a rhino's feet so close up yeah they're so always in the in the bush <laughs> yeah, so, yeah they're always hiding yeah to see the to see you know the the keratin on the nails you know their toenails and um to see the the way that the wrinkles go all the way down to the tops of their toes and how that pattern you know sets the the depth and the shape and everything so that was pretty special and um what i loved about it too is they're not just super tame rhinos they're they're still cheeky i mean <laughs> Annette says don't you know you, you don't want to really get out of the car because your smell is different and they'll they'll give you and i and rudy got butted <laughs> yeah this morning so um, yeah, that's, that's the, that was, that was really, really special. And Edda, how did they come to be here? What's, what's the story of the rhinos that we spent time with yesterday morning? Um, my, both, two of them, their mothers were poached. Um, the black rhinos mother's mother was poached during a full moon, full moon night. And that is usually what the poachers, um, use to their advantage is the light during the night. And um, the black rhino belongs to the government, so the um, Ministry of Environment obviously was informed and they went out and they uh, um, also saw the little black rhino calf, that it was alive, but it latched on to another mother and calf. And they were kind of hoping that it might get enough milk from that mother as well, maybe stealing her way through to, to just on, to stay, you know, to, for, to, to survive, um, which didn't happen. And they lost sight of it. And then four weeks later, they found the little calf again, but it was totally, totally uh, uh, dehydrated and starving. And um, so they called in the vet, and that night, it was another full moon night, and Moise came to us, and we struggled. I mean, there were moments where she was breaking down, and she was lying down, and I, I, I you know, I do, it was on the on the on the it, 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 I, I just pleaded with her and I said just get up once more just once more give me give that strength once more and I don't know if that's energy that that, that combines and and they do have a fighting spirit 
up to a point, you know, then, then there's no more, no more fuel in the tank. Um, and she got up and it was turning point. And, and, and she made it. So Mwesi was a special story. Um, often you get orphans that you think, oh, this is easy. They haven't had too much trauma, not too much physical um, um, injuries. And then it proves different. And then you have a case like Mwesi who was, you know, there was almost no hope for her. And she did it. And the elder one also came from a poaching incident. Um, her mother was poached. And the third one is indirectly poaching. Um, there was poaching taking place at a rhino owner's place, and he just couldn't fathom that um, fear of having more rhinos poached. Um, it was an emotional decision that he decided all rhinos have to be sold. He, he would rather sell them because he, he just cannot face that emotional um, roller coaster. Or, or the, the fear of, of losing more rhinos. And then also protecting, you know, how much do you put into protection? And it happened so that there was a buyer that could take every, all the whole herd over. But sometimes, you know, you obviously try to do your best to relocate mother and calf. And it often works, but there are cases where it didn't uh, work. And so the mother and the, the calf split up. Um, Alex was actually doing the helicopter work there, so he can actually sort of elaborate on that. Um, but then after the second time that they decided, you know, try to get the both both of them together, uh, they split up again, and so they decided it would be better for the calf to come in. So that's indirect poaching. That's, a, that's not something that gets talked about very much, Alex. This, the indirect consequences of it. We talk about, uh, you know, the loss of a rhino, the death of a rhino through poaching is the loss, but actually, there are people who previously looked after rhinos on their farms who, in this example, and that's just one example of many, I know many, many others, they're just, I can't do this anymore. Either they financially can't afford to do it or emotionally, like you're saying, can't afford to do it. Yeah, they, they don't want to see any rhinos die on their watch, so they'd rather sell all their rhinos and, uh, and, and have peace of mind instead of lay awake at night and, and worry about rhinos being poached. Um, and it's also, you know, you, you have, uh, like in this case, where you move a, a whole herd and then, um, you know, you have a, a, a two to three month old calf. And then when you let them go, the calves, just because of all the stress, uh, they, they just run into the bush and they never get back to their mothers again. In this case, um, this little calf ran about probably 20 miles until we finally got her. Um, like, you know, broke broke through a fence and just kept going. Um, and it was very lucky that we found her the late afternoon of the next day. Um, and, and uh, you know, so that's, that's where you have translocation of animals, but then also um, one of the main things now to, to try and deter poachers from poaching rhino is to dehorn rhino. Um, but when you dehorn cows with young calves, uh, you you um, you dart the cow and then usually the calf runs off and the hope is that within two to three days they'll find each other again but that's a lot of stress that the calf goes through um, you know just being split off from its mother from its mother even if it's just for two days and then in those two days you don't know um, you know if predators are going to go after the calf um, in most cases, they, they do find each other again, but it's all a stressful cycle that you put the animals through that you don't really want to put them through. And, and all of that is pretty good background for what is about to take place here. Um, John, why don't you maybe pick that up? Because it, the, the operation that's a, about to happen with the rhinos and the tracking project, for that to be possible, it first has to be funded. And this is, this is where you come into this, this story of... Mm -hmm. of uh, Rhino tracking. Yeah, I mean, you know, going going to art school, I thought to um, to become a sex, sex, successful artist, you just had to paint great paintings. But I didn't realize that the opportunity as you as you develop your career, the opportunity to influence um, pl uh, places and people and things and and, and programs. Um, was was there and it was I mean I I, I jumped in with both feet <laughs> embraced it in a big way and um, probably since 2000 well in the nine in, in the early 90s <clears throat> we you know and there's not a, probably an art, artist out there that has a certain level of success that doesn't um, donate a percentage of their work or donate their work or something to it and I used to do that a lot but I never really knew how money was spent 
I mean, I, I hoped it was going to go to the right place, but I never really understood it. And that couldn't concretely tell you the line of how dollars were spent. And so by, by, um, by uh, force, <laughs> I had, was forced to start our own foundation called Wildscapes in 2006. And um, like the world needed another foundation, right? I mean, that was, the, the, did not need another foundation, but it, it allowed us to be good custodians of, um, of resources and make sure that they apply to the right places. And I ha always said that we try to effectively get a 10x, um, uh, in other words, a dollar that comes through our foundation, we can get a 10x um, uh, feel to it by placing it surgically right where it needs to be placed versus have it fil filter down. So what also, um, you know, being, being an artist that has one foot in the hunting world and one foot in the non-hunting world, um, it's, it's, it's by virtue of that you get to um, access a lot of, um, you, you, get a, you get a free pass. <laughs> the art is not partisan in any way, shape, or form. And so I can, I can play on both sides of the arena. And there's a lot of programs that have raise money or you know clubs that raise money. This particular one happened to be a, a club that I'm involved with called Shikar Safari Club. And it's the oldest safari club. It started in 1952, so it bring it's it's the predecessor to Safari Club International. And when you look at the old names that started um, started Shikar Safari Club, you won't find anything about it on Google. <laughs> it's clandestine, you know. It's there's nothing out there about it. But it's it's made up of you know historically it was made up of some really prominent names: Robert Maytag. Um, uh, Prince Abdezera, uh, Shah of Iran's brother. I mean, they're really incredible people. The founder of the African Wildlife Foundation, um, st uh, Stans, uh, st uh, Maury Stans, um, one of the presidents or founders of the uh, African Wildlife Foundation. So it's a really great club, and we raise money every today. We raise, we have an auction during our annual event, and we raise money um, for conservation and apply it to really good projects. And because there's such a uh, an awareness within the club of, of through all of their international hunting, you have to have hunted a couple of um, international hunts, so you you um, can't even become in the in line for membership until that happens. But um, the there's such a <clears throat> understanding and appreciation for foreign projects that that's a big part of our grants every year. And um, and I, I mean I can go deeply into how I met the. Um, yeah, I, family. I, I, yeah. Well, that that is interesting to me. Because How I in, fell in love with this family. <laughs> because in the process of working on the film um, about Annette and her family and the elephant relocation, mm -hmm. I ended up with a, a folder full of images, and there's a picture with you standing with Annette and Jan. Yeah. From I don't, I don't know when that was, but it, it's uh, you all look a little younger, <laughs> <laughs> apart from Annette. <laughs> well, so I had, so, you know, I started exhibiting Safari Club, um, my work and, you know, I, 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 in the nosebleed section um, 30 years ago. And so um, over time, you know, you, you, you slowly go from the far right corner to the, to the middle of, of the, of the ex exhibition space. But I knew who the OFC family was. I knew Jan, he had a, such a reputation in the hunting industry. And um, I don't remember exactly what painting I had in the booth that time, or even how, what was the catalyst necessarily that we, we our worlds um, came together that day. But for me, it was really special. I mean, I knew who Annette was as well because she's so strikingly beautiful. I mean, w watching her, she, she stands out at the Savari Club, you know I mean? And so I remember, um, and here I was like, oh my gosh, Jan and Annette are in my booth and this is fantastic. And so we, I just, it was really, uh, um, it was very special for me to connect and just to, ha to have that, uh, those, these conversations. And I felt it, I felt that truly you just connected to wildlife wow. at, at a level that, um, I, I could count, count those number of people on one hand. And I, and I felt that intimate, um, that we ha had only communicated for a few moments, but there was this unspoken connection that I could feel through both of you, by the way, not just you, Annette, but um, Jan as well. And when you left my presence, you brought my, gave me one of your um, Jan's books and signed it. And when you left my presence, it's like I always said, I, I need to get to know those people. I need to get to become friends with them because we're kindred spirits. And time passed and it didn't allow it to happen. But I did, but I filed that in my head. 
And so um, then get to know Alex uh, at th through a mutual mutual connections with the Bering family. Um, it 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 was it was something that I wanted to do and wanted to get um, support for the Rhino program because they're winning. There's not a lot of people that are winning. When I say winning, meaning that they're not they haven't been they haven't been poached yet. Um, I say yet because that's a fear that doesn't go away. Um, I'm sure you think about it a lot. I think about it now that I understand the property, I get the, the vulnerabilities of it. But I said to um, our, our membership at our last meeting, I said, we have to in this triage moment of whether you agree pro-trade, anti-trade, all we know is we're losing, we're losing. And so let's just focus on the winners and let's put our resources towards people that are winning this game and button down the hatches. I'm not sure what tomorrow is going to bring, but I know we can win this day. We can win the day. So that's why I wanted to be um, spearhead this, get this grant to do this new program that um, this, this tracking program that they'll share with you about. And I was so happy that we got it. And um, uh, inshallah, God willing, there's so much more to come. So, um, and, but that's isn't that what it's about? Is is really saying you know where's where's the tangible difference you can make and and make it. Make it so that um, you can see any 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 uh, nonprofit uh, philanthropic effort. You want to see the tangible effects of what your your dollars went towards. There's a, there's a lot of people give money to things, all, all manner of things, uh, not just in the conservation space. Mm -hmm. That it's very difficult to pinpoint and put your finger on the things that my money did this. Mm -hmm. And I I really love that as a concept because I think generally speaking in the world of um, charities and foundations, a lot of money that is wasted in the world. It doesn't actually go directly towards something that's going to make a difference on the ground. Oh, and so this, this is an amazing example of mm -hmm. here is um, an amount of money that is going into a project which is going to make a difference mm -hmm. from the day that it is implemented. Mm -hmm. And if you could have seen the grant application, and you did it really quick, I was surprised. And um, it was so detailed, spelled out you know, how, how it was going to be spent for these different categories. And it was very, very impressive package. So, um, yeah. We, f we feel honored and humbled and appreciate the, 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 um, the, uh, you know, the, 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 the power or the, the, your strength that you put forward to your club, you know, to, to, um, sort of convey this, the, the, the depth of this or the, the urgency. Because um, you know, at times we feel so on the edge of threatened, and then having that come forward, and knowing there's so much energy and so much people behind us with that funding that we can jump that step ahead again, it gives us all that optimism back and all the energy back again to um, you know just to f keep fighting for what we're doing. Thank you, John. Yeah, I yeah. really, really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. We wow. we were uh, we were jumping up and down with joy when you let us know that the, the grant was approved. So thank I you so much. I love your mom's message. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> it, it was really beautiful. But um, and again, I'm I'm not uh, you know I am just I, I'm a person who latches onto an idea and I won't let it go. And so I just I just kept working that to make sure that um, everyone understood that how we have to think about this. Um, you know, we, we, we have to, again, we have to encourage the people that are winning that have a chance that they can weather the storm whenever that storm is going to end. And I have, and not, not one of us sitting in these chairs, Byron, you yourself included, don't believe that, you know, there's, there'll be some, there'll be some sunny days after this storm. You have, or you just, or you'd give up if you didn't believe that. So you have to you have to hold on to optimism, and, and we that's that's uh, that's why I was uh, so happy that um, all that so pushing much. happened. And and I think if I you know just can add on to what you said about about you know why you started your own foundation so you could see where the dollars went, and you know here we have this amazing grant coming from a hunting club. And I think if you look at, at funding that goes directly into the ground, so much gets done by hunters. If, if it's not by donations or fundraising, every hunter that hunts in Africa, the money they spend in Africa goes into conservation, you know. Um, and and when, when people think about uh, fundraising for conservation purposes, it's, it's always, um, you know, they, they always think about the, 
the the greens and 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 you know all these big nonprofits and that but so little of the money generated by all these big nonprofits actually makes it to the ground whereas when you look at the hunting community um you know that's it's 90 of that money gets to where it needs to go whereas if you look at the, all the other big uh, ngos that yeah, I wonder if even 10% of that money gets to where it needs to go. Mm -hmm. You know, Alex, so when, when I get the, for the privilege and the opportunity often to speak to, to audiences and sometimes they're hunting audiences, sometimes they're not hunting audiences. And clearly there's often, sometimes there's lots of anti-hunters in, in audiences. Um, it depends on where in the country. I've spoken Palo Alto uh, one time at an event. And uh, there were tons of non-hunter, anti-hunters in the audience. But the point is, when you you ask the audience, how many people have actually been to Africa in this room? And you know, you'll get, you know, you speak Seattle, California, New York. You'll get uh, often maybe ten percent of the room will raise their hand. You know, especially if you're speaking to an affluent audience. You ask a group of of hunters, just in general, how many people have been to Africa? Seventy-five to eighty percent of that, their hands will go up. And then you change it and then you say, how many people have been here? And I did this just recently. I said, how many people have been more than three times? Probably three quarters of those hands stayed up. How many people have been five times? Half those hands stayed up. How many have been 10 times or more? A third of those hands stayed up. Doesn't hit, doesn't happen. So you tell me, I mean, that's, you know, when you talk about people having heart and soul into uh, conserving you know wildlife on the landscape you tell me who has greater skin in the game than someone who's gone 10 times or five times or three times to a location hunters there they, they there's no half measure <laughs> yeah, yeah no exactly um and and you know this is something we were talking about the other days is, is um you know you you have people say well why can't you just do um, um non-consumptive utilization of the animals why can't you just do photo tourism i think well there are so many hidden parts in africa where uh, photos a safari tourist won't even think about going or won't dare going they they want to go to the easy destinations but a hunter wants to go to the forest in cameroon they they want to go to the the deep dark spots in africa to go and experience it to go and see those animals um and and they are really the ones driving the funding of conservation in africa mm -hmm. No question about it. That the market, the markets are so different. Um, you know, we have a travel company, so we understand on the photographic side how distinctly different they are. And the minute something breaks out in Chad or Sudan or Ethiopia, all those they're all canceled. That's, That's when yeah. I want to get on a plane and go. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. I, I don't know what's wrong with me, but that's that's kind of. <laughs> but you're right. You're right, though. It's the it's the first to drop off. There, I bet you the first tour, international tourist you had. Um, <laughs> I hope I'm right here. First international tourist you had coming back were probably hunters after COVID. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, they were they were the first ready to travel and, and the first uh, to to take the step um, and and <clears throat> because we, we do both we we do photo safaris and we do hunting so we have the direct comparison um, so it's of, of course it's different for every country it's different for from region to region but for us here we need about seventy two tourists for the same turnover as one hunter. And that's, you, a and that's a big footprint. If you if you look at a carbon footprint of seventy two people compared to one person, on an average one hunter might shoot six or seven animals. Um, you know, you almost need more than that to feed <laughs> the seventy two yeah. people. And if you look at the amount of, of waste generation, the amount of energy you use to take care of seventy two people, and then the impact on the bush with all these game viewers driving in and and uh, just disturbance. Whereas if you have one guy who becomes part of the system. Um, it's it's it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing difference. If we can just go back to the because uh, I'm I'm aware of the fact we skipped over what we're actually doing with the rhinos. <laughs> we went off on an amazing tangent there, uh, Alex. Maybe maybe you can pick this up because you're going to be doing uh, a lot of well, all of the flying. Actually, you're going to be the one actually getting the vet down on top of the right rhino in the right place for this project. Give me an overview of the application that John was talking about and what you intend to do and why you need it. Um, so our property, um, altogether our property now is about 85,000 acres. So it's a big area to protect. Um, and our rhinos roam the whole area. 
So it's it's a it's a monumentous task to just keep track of them every day. Um, so we would we we have tracking units on some of our other species lions and elephants. Um, and um, for years we've been wanting to do the rhinos as well, um, but because of the volume of rhinos, it's just it's 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 uh, tremendously expensive. And that's where where John came in, and then this, this amazing grant from Sri Car Safari Club came in. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be putting tracking units in the horns of the rhinos. So what we do is we, we dart a rhino when it goes down you you drill a hole into the horn so the horn on the rhino is basically just keratin so it's like fingernail so drilling a hole into the horn doesn't it doesn't hurt the rhino at all it's like clipping your fingernails so we drill um about an inch and a half hole um, into the horn and then we epoxy a tracking unit into the horn and um, with that we can keep track of our rhinos um, the big thing is if if there's no movement in the tracking unit for a certain period of time it gives you an alert and you can go and check and and see um, what's going on um, so all this is just uh, another tool in the arsenal to look after the rhinos and try and keep them protected and try and keep them alive and what is the logistics of the day is going to look like when you're when you're doing this. Um, it's going to be long days, so uh, we're we're going to go up and basically just start doing a grid through the property, looking for rhinos, and then as soon as we find them, we'll start working. And um, um, we have a few people on board um, the crew, and everybody's going to be part of it. Um, and uh, hopefully, if we if we have uh, good days, um, we'll probably be able to do about ten rhinos a day. Um, so, so we'll, vet so tranquilize vet, up the helicopter ground team comes in and then install the tracking unit wake the rhino up and then go for the next one so how long should that take it once once everybody is become slick and efficient after um, after, right? after we get played in we should uh, it, it, it all depends on how long it takes to find the rhino in the first place but from when we find the rhino um, get the dart in until we wake it up again um, should be half an hour to 40 minutes Quick. yeah yeah, you 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 tend you want to keep get the rhino back up on its feet as soon as possible. You you don't want to keep it under for um, too long. Um, so uh, the first ones will take a little longer, but as soon as we get uh, get um, you know everything, all the the cogs uh, oiled, then it'll uh, hopefully will be hopefully we'll get it down to about thirty minutes to have rhino back on its feet. Anetta, how are you feeling about the operation that's about to start? Because I know on one hand, there is a certain amount of relief because you're going to be able to pick up your phone and see where all your rhinos are. But equally, I've done enough big game capture with you <laughs> to know the emotional burden of, it, of undertaking it. Yeah, I think to me, it's, um, it's always that weighing up, the balance of it. Um, I know that the, I'm always, I'm, I'm the softy. Um, I always think about the disturbance, and especially when it comes to mother and cow. Uh, uh, mother and, and calf. Um, so, but the, at, with this program, I weigh up the the disturbance is going to be there, but I also know that that recovers quite quickly because this is not like uh, transporting and it's just you get the rhino, you get the work done, up is the rhino. It's in it's it stays in its environment. So the disturbance factor is going to be sort of. Uh, um, um, can, yeah, it's going to be at the minimum. And weighing it up, the advantage of having, of being able every day to get onto the screen and see that the rhino is moving and that it's fine and that it's that as well. That is so much um, um, uh, to, to, our, to our system and to our protection of the rhino. And it, it just gives me peace of mind. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. And, and knowing you, you're going to be there when every rhino goes down. Yes. <laughs> yes well, we we uh, we we definitely uh, we uh, without my mom there we'd be lost because she knows every rhino by name. She knows every marking on every rhino. She knows what the horns look like on every rhino. So uh, there's a uh, we have a uh, we won't say the number, but there's a, there's a large number of both black and white rhino on this property and she knows every single one by name. <laughs> <laughs> and I've seen this. I've seen this when we've been out. <laughs> it's, it's quite amazing. You know what's really exciting, Aaron, is that they can, they can do this program, this um, you know, uh, tracking device inside the horn because they leave the horns on. You know, they're not removing the horns. I mean, how many programs exist out there in this unbelievable high-pressure poaching uh, environment in Southern Africa 
that you that that you leave the horns so on. Few. And so few. How does and, uh, I'm curious, John? You spend a lot of time studying animals, particularly big animals in Africa. How does it make you feel when you're in places where you have to, you understand the necessity why they've had to take the horns off this magnificent animal, but having that constant reminder there. Yeah, I mean, you, you look out and you see a rhino, you know, you go to many, many places in Southern Africa and that, that does dehorning. I understand and I appreciate it and I know the, the consequences and I know that they're doing it because they have to, not because they want to. But it just reminds you of, of how, how this whole system is broken, this whole process is broken. Um, from from the source of the desire, the, de the demand in Asia, to the way that CITES has uh, positioned their their um, all the all the signatories to CITES, and how every time that it comes up for a pro trade um, position, uh, it gets declined, and how um, the value uh, that black market value just keeps escalating. So more and more people want to get in the game. More and more unscrupulous individuals want to get in the game because of those attractive dollars. And every time I see a rhino, I, I, unfortunately, it's hard to look past that blaring billboard that says failure, failure, crisis, crisis, you know, um, and just be in presence of the rhino. That's what's so fabulous about here and a few other places um, that the rhino is a rhino is a, a rhino is an evolutionary marvel. And the horn is what, you know, the, the, the horn is what makes it so unique. Is one of the things that makes it so unique, I should say. And to see a, you know, a 36, 40 inch horn on the tip of a nose of an animal that uses that tool for defense. It's a dinosaur, uses, isn't it? It's a dinosaur. <laughs> I mean, it's spectacular to, it's to a see. It's a modern day dinosaur, yeah. we, we forget this. Yeah, and to see it have it cut off, you know, to me is just tragic. It's just so tragic. So yeah, as an artist, um, I'm, I'm so stoked about seeing rhinos being what the rhino has, uh, uh, you know, morphed into, and, and it's a rhino at its best. Mm -hmm. And you, you've actually seen the end result of poaching in markets before. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, wild, wild trip. Um, uh, you know, we hear about, you know, the Ch China market is driving, the Chinese are driving the market as consumers. And um, that's where most of the, the rhino horn ends up, whether it be TCM's traditional Chinese medicine or used as some sort of a status symbol. But I, you know, like many people, we hear that, we might see photographs, we see films, but um, I wanted to go personally and see it. So what do you, what do, you do when you, you know, want to have, a, when you have a question? You go, go find the answer and you go to Amazon first. <laughs> so I went to Amazon and bought this pen that was a beautiful, looked like a Mont Blanc pen. It was a very, it was a beautiful writing instrument. And inside of it is a hidden camera with a great recording device that you just stick in your, in your pocket. And that was my tool to go and record all of this, these stories. So the primary, um, it's illegal to trade in China. It's not sold in open markets. I'm sure that there's a strong underground black market, but I want to see the open markets where people are buying it and who are the people that are buying this. So I had a choice of going to Vietnam or Laos and we went to Laos. And Laos is um, uh, is um, a very interesting country. Um, it, there's we went to Lu, Lu, Luan Prabang. Um, gosh, now I can't remember the other town. And then the Golden Triangle. And so those three places are where it's sold in open markets. And really trying to profile um, who is buying that product. But I had to have a story. You know, you can't just go in and say. Uh, Hi, I'm here, and John, I hi. Yeah, um, I said. So I said that my wife is Chinese, and she's having a 50th birthday, and I, I look. I want to get a really large horn for our mantle, and um, there was a lot of rhino worked rhino horn in display and and, and, and the uh, glass cases and on shelves and things. By the way, as well as stacks and stacks of pangolin scales, tiger tiger um, claws. Uh, uh, hornbill fashion beads of hornbill, um, uh, tons of ivory, ivory trinkets, worked ivory, raw pieces of ivory, you know, 13, maybe 16 inch uh, uh, tusks, the end of tusks. Um, but uh, I wanted something, you know, and lots of rhino horn amongst that. But I wanted something really big. So the first play, the first city that we went to that had um, lots of rhino product, 
I said, you know, I want this big horn. And the guy pulls out his cell phone and, and I start scrolling through it. <laughs> and Byron, I had to, I had to, I had a really good sense of where my film angle was. So I always had this little bit of a crook to my body <laughs> and I'm holding the phone up so that I could show their two faces as I'm scrolling through the, the um, horns. They had dozens of horns. Some of them are, you know, blood horn that you can see that was, you know, pho photographed laying on a floor fresh, killed. Um, and I said, how, when, when can you have, you know, I picked out a couple of them. I said, when can you have them here? He says, tomorrow morning. Um, I didn't go back <laughs> tomorrow morning because, you know, you also know the risk of, of uh, being exposed. And so I was also very felt, felt um, you know, that uh, the story of, of capturing how the market sold, who's, who's the customer, that was a big part of the desire. I found the where, the why, and now I needed the, the who. And the who was um, just observing and seeing who's in those, especially the Golden Triangle, where 90% of the rhino horn that I saw was for sale in the Golden Triangle. It's the place in the world where you can get everything that is illegal. And, um, and I wanted to profile, and you know, basically came out about the ages between 35 and 55. Um, well, to do successful driving you know, parking lots filled with Audi cars and Mercedes and luxury brands, um, BMWs, um, uh, they're expensive. You know, these items are expensive. You hold up a, a small chalice of, of a rhino horn that's fashioned for a cup, let's call it the size of a big coffee cup. That's 36, 000, that was $36,000 at the time. Rhino was trading for $30,000 a kilo. That'd be, it'd be, be 70 grand today. Um, so, you know, you, you realize that this is not a, a poor person buying it. What was interesting, though, is as I saw this demographic age, it's primarily male. Um, they're all, they're lots of beautiful women around in the casinos and all the, the markets and such. Um, but it's a, it, they're buying it because they're, they're at the top of their game. They're successful. It's a display of the success. So is that car in the parking lot. So is the clothes that they're wearing. It's a display of success. But, um, you know, you think about that 55, that back end, we think about TCMs. I mean, I think half of the TCMs are fake. And you talk to people that are in it, to traditional Chinese medicine, you know, there's no way to prove it. So I don't think of that TCMs is where the problem is. It's in that, it's in that status symbol is where it's driving this crazy pricing and the demands. And, you know, you think of the escalating middle class, middle class is aspirational too. They want to, you know, we get to the back end of the top end of the middle class and you want to have signs that, Hey, I made it. I'm, I'm successful. Someone who's 60 and 70 years old, I'm, I'm on the precipice of 60 right now. I've recognized that there's a, a lot of changes that happen when you start to hit those 60s and 70s. And then one of them is you don't really care what people think. <laughs> you know, you don't really you don't care. You don't need a status symbol, you know what I mean? And so I, that's why I think the back end of that, that is, you know, it can be defined. It, you have to be roughly around 35 to have the wealth to be able to drop 60 grand for a chalice. Um, but by the time you get to be 60 and you know, 70, you don't really care. So that's where I think the influenceable part of the market could be, could be targeted towards. Hmm. I suppose the big question is how. Yeah. And, then, and that is something that no one's been able to answer to this yeah. point. I have a theory. You want to hear my theory? Go for it. We can broadcast it to the world and then we can implement <laughs> your theory. I, my theory is that if you, if you took, you know, working through a campaign, all of the, you know, top Ogilvy and top uh, branding companies, top uh, PR companies, and you put a campaign together with all of the uh, cultural influencers, music, in, music industry, the fashion industry, uh, you know, uh, modeling, um, uh, 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 acting, and you put those influencers and got them on part of this campaign. And the goal of the campaign would be to say, that rhino horn, that was your mom's and your grandmother's. You're, you're modern, you're contemporary, you're happening, you're hip. You know, that, that's, that's yesterday's stuff. Because if you look at the modern generation in, in, in China, big time in China, they, they're slowly, they're, they want to have their own thing, you know, their own stuff, their own stuff. And that's true with any civilization, by the way. It's not just China. Uh, China. It's true in America. It's true in Europe. They want to have their own kind of, this is, this is us. This is our generation. And so if you can create this sense of that's yesterday's thing, 
But here's the new thing, and this is where the gap lies, Byron. I don't know what the new thing is, but if you can get some smart brains to figure out what that is, that, and it's probably something to do with technology or a digital, it's got a, some component to um, the, the, the era that we're in right now that's more merging, but it's sustainable. And it's not a wildlife product, it's not a plant, it's not really a natural thing. It might have natural origins, but if you can all have everybody target that, because if you tell them don't do that, when you're successful, you want to break that rule. You double down, you want to do it. But you say, don't do that because don't, don't, don't tell them don't do. That's just, just brand it as your grandmother's, that's your grandmother's stuff. This is what's cool. This is what's hip. This is the new thing. And you launch that globally in one, one big thrush with every influencer in every category behind it with the digital capacity right now with, you know, China uses WeChat. They live on WeChat. I'm telling you, you could, you could actually move the needle. I tr truly believe that. I don't know what it takes. Is it $100 million? Is it $50 million? Is it $200 million? I don't know what the ca capital campaign cost. But, um, you know, there's some very successful people out there that have that. That would be a drop in the bucket for them to, to, to leave a legacy of, you know, profound change. Um, I think it can be happening because, you know, spending a lot of time in China, they're, 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 not, they're, they're just disconnected from the fact that that tr the tr the uh, um, extreme um, what's the word I'm looking for you know ca uh, carnage that's the word carnage in the field for that beautiful chalice to be held and you know sitting on your mantle the carnage they they're just completely disconnected from it they're not bad people I mean I hung out with them for days and uh, they're not bad people at all I talked I, I probably was the only one that didn't smoke you know what I mean but um, they're not bad people it's just that that's just understanding that um, you're trying to, 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 to push the campaign that Yao Ming and um, uh, Jackie Chan did, yeah. And you know, that, that, was, that was, don't do this because of this. That probably did move a few people, but I, it didn't, it just, it's just, there's a disconnect. So we have to focus on this idea of that's cool and that it isn't. And you know, in other categories, that's been done. There's been things that are really trending and now they're no longer trendy. I mean, Facebook is one of them. That's, that's old people. I mean, my, my kids and kids that are, you know, uh, teen, let's say uh, 20 and under, Facebook is, that's, that's like yesterday stuff. So you can move it quick if it's just targeted correct, correctly. I don't know, maybe I'm nuts, Byron, but I, I think that there is, there is a chink in the armor and that's where, that's where it's at. Alex, you and I talked a, a, a lot of length about uh, rhino horn trade and how that could be implemented. So I don't, I don't necessarily want to go and cover all of that ground again because we can I can refer people back to uh, w when that podcast comes out, which will actually come up before this one. But just to, off the back of what John said, something has to change. How long do we have at the current rates if we don't implement you know whatever that is, whether it's John's brainchild, whether it's rhino horn trade, whether it's something else we haven't discussed? How long do we have? for the rhino to carry on existing into well, the future. If, if, we, if we look at the, at the stats from roughly the last 70 years, so in, in 1950 we had 100,000 black rhino, uh, today we have 5,000 black rhino. So that's 95,000 black rhino we've lost in 70 years. And if you look at the poaching on white rhino since 2010, um, it, it, it basically comes down to an average of 1,000 rhino a year we've lost. So if we follow the same stats, we're looking at another about 15 years until we've lost all wild populations of rhino. So it's, it's to the point where we need to think of something fast because we're getting to the point where we're getting to, if we keep losing rhino at, that, at this stage, we're going to have a few isolated little populations that we're keeping alive, but we're going to sit with a huge genetic bottleneck. Um, <clears throat> so... Whatever we do, we need to do it fast to to keep the species alive. Clock is ticking. Yeah. How, how has that journey been for you, Annette, over the last? How, when was the, when did your first orphan come in? The first orphans that came in were more sort of from from cases where the mother died of old oh, age. So or... Your first ones weren't poaching. Yeah. So you've seen that change where it was yeah. just yeah, life, so the nature, yeah. circumstances oh, to exactly. 
exactly. um, as the, at the hand of humans. Yes, exactly. Wow. So the first ones came in and I was so privileged and I, the very first one that came in, I thought, this is once in a lifetime. I'm going to embrace this. This is, I will never... Because it wasn't common to have orphans, yes, uh, have, so have the need. Probably the very first orphan in Namibia wow. that was raised. Um, because it came also from um, our Ministry of Environment had this vision of um, it was a few vets in in the Ministry of Environment had the vision of of um, taking the po the satellite populations out of the Etosha National Park and the western parts to various privately owned um, 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 areas to first of all, exponentially increase safety for them, but also the, on, on the breeding side. Because in, 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 a, in one herd, you always have the 50% males, 50% females. And so with the dominant male, he pushes out the young bulls, and you will always have young bulls that are not really a value to the herd because he keeps them. But by splitting up and taking a few satellite populations out, Immediately, they had these bulls in production. They could breed up. And so from only 400 black rhino in 1995, we, the country bred them up to over 2,000 now. And that was that vision that they had. And obviously also because of the, um, the, 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 the poaching that they probably didn't anticipate then. But in hindsight, that helped greatly to also have these yeah and so in the beginning that the very first orphan came from from when they started capturing um, to do to to put these satellite uh, populations out they captured a heavy and calf cow and so it was sort of a natural thing and, and this orphan was naughty yeah. yeah and she's now 28 and she's got 10 calves she's in calf with number 11 and so the very the, the first ones and then there was a time where it was quiet because poaching was more done in Botswana, South Africa, Namibia was kind of a hidden gem still. We were not, um, I think it's because our land is so big and it wasn't as easy to poach as it was in the other countries. Um, and then in 2010, it started rolling in. One after the other came from poaching incidences. Um, so lately I had out of the, this is number 18 that we've, we've received and raised. Obviously we lost a few. Um, but there were, out of the last, probably the last 12 calves, there were only two that came from natural causes. The one, the mother was stabbed by an elephant, and it was a natural cause because it was drought and, you know, so the feeding places. Session. And yeah, and uh, the other one had, the, his mother died of, of um, kidney complications. But the rest was all from poaching. So you've been mother to a lot of rhinos. Yeah. And it's so sad, you know, when it comes and you get so upset, you get so angry with the world that you think this amazing species has evolved and has, has, has survived millennia and been pushed by people encroachment into the driest parts and survived still. And now we as humans come and we wipe it out like just over a couple of years and, and and it's so sad like you were saying it's it's this um, dinosaur kind of creature that has survived and evolved into if you look at them living in Damaraland of a, a, a milk um, like a euphorbia which is actually poisonous to most of the other elements the rhino survive on that mm -hmm. I mean, you put us as humans there two days and we're gone. <laughs> and so it's so unfair. Now we come and we, we wipe them off there. Um, and so when the rhino orphans come in, you know, when it's a natural death to the mother, then one, one accepts it and you, you're right there. And even with the ones that are coming from the, from the poaching, it's, but you get so angry when it comes from poaching because also that calf is so much more traumatized um, and also physical injuries. You know, the last calf, sadly, they um, they hacked to death with a machete because the calf, when they poach the mother and they want to get to it and cut off the horn, that calf fiercely protects the mother. And if that calf gets in the way, they either shoot it or, like the last case, they just hacked it to death. The calf, um, was, the calf was four days old. Yeah, mm -hmm. four days old, yeah, yeah. And so that makes you angry. Um, 
you put everything forward to to and I think that is also the um, gives you so much when when you when you then successful in saving this little rhino it, 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 the bond and the connection is so much deeper because you've 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 gone that emotional journey with them and you feel the reward and you you're just looking forward to the day when you can release it and put it back and be part of the species again so they can be rhino and forget all that and that, that's a really important point about the way that you um, run this rehabilitation uh, program, I suppose, informal program that you've repeated again and again so successfully, is that it, it requires you to be very intimately connected with these very, very small rhino that are, that are coming in. But ultimately, your ambition is that they go outside the outside the, the the small smaller enclosure inside the the farm here and be a rhino with the other rhino yeah that's that's very very it's important. not that they are a tame rhino for the rest of their life no you want them i always say my my my, my task of rewilding actually almost starts the day they come in because that's my aim that is they have to become rhino they have to be a value to their species and so and like you said, you know, you need to give them the protection and the connection and the and the comfort and the. They need to know that that this is if they get a fright, this is where they find the comfort, and so you do connect very deeply with them. But they're also very intelligent, and instinctively, they are a wild species, and so. But as as we raise them, as I raise them, I take distance in that when they become bigger, they can take more quantity of milk at one time. So I, I um, increase the intervals and um, all that is part of, by the time they do not need milk anymore, they are ready to go out there and, 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 and just be rhino. Use that word, be rhino. I mean, it's, you know, having, having studied rhino for decades and painted so many of them in my very first book, Beast has a rhino on the cover of it, black rhino. Is that the one that's sitting just here? Yeah, that, and that has on the, <laughs> on the cover. Um, I, did you just put that out when I was coming? No, it's, it's <laughs> always, it's always, it's sh there's a fear of shifting because then I look through some others and, you know, it keeps shifting. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it's it, when you look at a rhino, it, it's unique in the animal kingdom. It's muscularity, it's, it's shape, it's, um, it's the way that the head attaches to the spine, the skull attaches to the spine, um, the width of its rump, you know, it's as wide as an elephant. Um, it's it's uh, the, the, the double horn, the length of the horn, where the eyes sit on the skull, the scale of the ears and the mobility of the ears. Um, this is a, this is a evolutionary master. It's a master at evolution. And what a, what a, you know, dichotomy that it's on the precipice of extinction in this modern time. I mean, we should be, we should be embracing this, um, symbol of, of, you know, natural selection and perfection, but instead it's, it's, you know, right on the edge of, of falling off of, of the cliff. I mean, it, it, it's unique in the animal kingdom. There's no other animal that you can, you know, all these other, you know, um, antelope and uh, ungulates and, you know, bovine and, you know, they kind of all, but the rhino stands alone and in, in, the, in, in independent. It's not even like an elephant, like there's elephants and then there's rhino, you know, <laughs> I mean, rhino is just unbelievable creature. And I just find it, it's, it's, it's passed all these thresholds and it's arrived in, you know, this end of the, uh, uh, 20, you know, 2000 to 21st century, entering the 21st century. And, and it's on the edge of collapse just because of that. Well, two things, because of the way that we're managing it and because of the demand for that precious commodity that's been perceived to, you know, elevate uh, and, 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 and become a, a symbol of success. Just so, it just breaks my heart. Have you had any time to spend with some of the Asian rhino species? Um, I was in Sumatra, and uh, when we were there, that they were going to be declaring that the Sumatran rhino was extinct because they said there are uh, WCS has a long-standing program there, oh, and um, yeah, they, there's a word that they use. What is it? What do you say? Functionally, Functionally extinct. Yeah. Um, 
there are a few left, but but basically it's it's past it's it's pushed off the precipice. Yeah. It's still in the air. <laughs> yeah. It hasn't hit the ground. It hasn't hit the ground yet. But I mean, that, so the answer is I personally have not. You know, the Indian rhino I haven't seen, um, other than captive environments. Um, I haven't seen them in the wild. Um, but I see, I see a trip that needs to happen here. John and Anetta <laughs> need to go and see some Asian rhino, the ones that are left. Yeah, no, it, would be, it would be amazing. And that, again, that one horned rhino, that's another really cool creature that is, again, dif different and unique than the African species. But um, I, I, it's, it's, uh, it's just, I, I can't even put into, you know, find the words. It's just so, it can be so overwhelmingly depressing and sad to be witness of this, to be, have this happen on our watch. It would be incredibly sad if the strokes of your brush, and some of which I've seen you doing in your studio in Seattle, become an archive rather than a reflection of what exists. Rather than a celebration. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, it's like if I did a painting of a T-Rex. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <You know? laughs> I mean, it kind of, yeah, it is. Mm. When, when you look at landscape scale conservation from rhinos and beyond. Let's just stick in Africa because that's where we're all sitting right now and that's what we've been talking about. Where do you see the future of that, John? Where do you see the success points for us to keep ecosystems intact and where they're not intact, reestablish them at least in a way where they can function and we can exist alongside nature. I'm not sure how many places there are truly left where we exist separate from it, or we, we don't, humans don't have a hand inside these areas of nature. I think we're almost beyond that in most places. We have impacted almost everywhere at this mm -hmm. point. Yeah, we have. Um, for those of your listeners that haven't been to Africa, um, Africa's massive. You take China, India, New Zealand, Argentina, all of Europe, and the entire continental U.S., and place it inside Africa, the African continent. It's massive. So much diversity, biological diversity. The big things, the Pleistocene era is still alive and palpable and tangible in Africa. That's the gift that we have in this moment. And then you think about, you know, it's got 100,000 species of known insects, 3,000 species of fish, 2,600 bird species, um, 1,100 mammal species, uh, 60 species of carnivores, 3,000 different ethnic groups, and a huge human population is about to hit this continent like the, like the globe has never seen in human history. According to the UN, it's supposed to be 42% of the global population at the latter part of the century. If you do the math on that, that's... 600 billion with a B pounds of added omnivore biomass, added biomass. And us and omnivore biomass humans consume more resources per pound than any other creature on the planet. So you think about the wave of humanity that's coming on in this, if, if everything stays according to what projections are. Um, so I say in that moment, you know, we should focus on the, the biomes. If you, if you think of Africa as a human body, we're going to lose an arm, we're going to lose an ear, we're going to lose a leg, we're going to lose, you know, part of our nose, we're going to lose, we're going to lose body parts here. But if we can keep the heart and the lungs pump, pumping, the patient won't die. And so I say that, that we need to focus on those key biomes, those key spaces, and, and put our resources, because it's always about dirt. I, I always am amazed at how resilient um, and I know you guys know this better than anyone, um, Alex and, and Annette, is that if you just get, if you just take a landscape and protect it and give, you know, food and water and shelter, security, Africa saves itself. Species save themselves. They're really good at it. They've been doing it for millions of years. So we need to protect these landscapes, these key landscapes, so that when that wave of humanity comes, and we lose so many of these other areas. Some of these connective, connective zones um, are, are, are our last vestige of, 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 of what was, what used to be. Um, 
I think that's that's where we need to you know kind of rethink and refocus our attention and and you know we know that cyclone is coming, and so you know the other, let me just make you know, this is where your world is Byron you 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 converge between you know animals and humans you that's the you know, nature and human and the human experience and 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 I think about I, I you know I think about this wave of humanity coming. But it's also influenceable, you know, if you, t I, Tanzania is one of the country that I know the stats really well. And if you take the, the amount of a woman in childbearing years in the urban areas, um, she's producing about 3.4 children per, per woman. And if you look at it in the rural areas, it's about 6.6 6 and, 6 and, 6 and six and a half, let's just say, I'm just rounding 6.3, 6.2. What is the difference between those two areas and that, that woman of the same age? but she happens to live one place or the other. It's education. The woman in the rural areas barely finished primary school. The woman in the urban areas finished secondary school. And as, you, as a woman gets educated and she has choices and she has, um, uh, has more going for her than just to be a, uh, a termite, <laughs> a childbearing uh, wor worker bee, um, and, and she can contribute to her society and she brings value and she has dignity and pride, suddenly you start to see those metrics change. And I, and I, and I, and I know that um, that's been debatable about all the, you know, as, as, as lots of health things come and that, that population continues to rise on the grid, gets steeper and steeper, that increase. But one thing that it can be, that can help put that in a balance is educating women. Mm -hmm. It's a big part of it. And, and we've seen that in other parts of the world now that have great health systems, but education and financial upliftment as well. As people move through and become middle have class. Have a chance to financially lift your, 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 if you're educated. Yeah. Without it, and you, you also don't. don't want that many children because you realize that you yourself have a higher standard. China's yeah. a great example of that. Yeah. They lifted the two child, uh, sorry, the one child policy. Mm -hmm. Most of the middle China don't want to have two kids. Mm -hmm. And they are looking at a population which is going to start declining if it hasn't already, actually, which is mind blowing if you think of the discussions of China and population from 15 years ago. Right. I don't know, think they ever saw that coming, yeah. but they've become much more prosperous in the last 20 years, mm -hmm. and most people only want to have one kid. Yeah, it's it's a, it's um, it, it's it's a it's a it's a moment in time that we're we're on the again precipice of great great change. And um, uh, it's, it's, it's just overwhelming when you think of the scale of all these changes. But again, this places like, um, you know, your, your farm and your, your property. Uh, I always mess up the name, Okin, Okinjanti. Okinjanti, Okinjanti. Um, uh, the places like that where, you know, you've, you can preserve a species, you can, or conserve, let's use the word conserve. I don't like the word preserve because no, preserve, preserve means, means static. Yeah. Preserve also is like what Russia does with the Zapovedniks. They're called biosphere reserves and you can't go into them. Humans aren't allowed to go into them. They got the greatest national parks, let's say the potential of greatest national parks, maybe in the world. <laughs> and and you, unless you're a scientist or biologist, you cannot go into the Zapovedniks. Um, but the, the, uh, the, the, you know, these places that are, are winning the game at a conservation scale, um, that's, that's, that's to me where in the, in, the, in the darkness, when I look out on the future sometimes, and so much sadness that I, that, I, that I see and I fear coming, I have to keep my face towards the light. Is a better light a candle than a curse of the darkness? Um, I, I just keep it towards the places that are winning because those are worth celebrating. Those are worth um, acknowledging and supporting and, being, um, and saying, look, it's not all horrible. We're winning some of them. And then just paint a picture of how your place here came to being. Because you, you drive around here now, like we did this morning, John, and we're in herds of elephants. Yesterday we were watching uh, a pride of lions ripping apart an ostrich with some little cubs. It was amazing. There's antelope everywhere. But I know that when Jan first got here and when the two of you started putting this place together, it was a very different story. Yeah, when Jan came here, all this land was cattle land. So cattle farming. All, all it was cattle land, cattle farms, and there were maybe four species that occurred here naturally. That was the kudu, gemsbok, steenbok, and wardog. And um, 
Jan always loved nature, always wanted to give back to nature as much as he could. And so his, his drive and his vision and all came about also because of his capture method. He suddenly could capture game and, and translocate it to areas that had been depleted. And, and so the business started. And obviously when he, uh, when he was selling game, uh, when he captured a herd, it had mostly 50% males, 50% females. The buyer only wanted maybe just one, one bull in the herd. And so he was um, left with uh, mostly male animals as well. And so, um, but his vision and his, his, his passion to, 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 to just recreate, um, you know, to, to turn around the cattle land again into nature and give it back to nature was so strong, his passion for it. And by coincidence, we met up and it was just meant to be, you know, it's just uh, that we were a strong team together because we had the same. We never looked far ahead. We worked for today and what we could do today and the opportunities that came up. And and um, and there were some diet, you know, there was some blood and sweat that went in there and there was some worry sometimes where we thought we we're going to lose it all because we didn't have money. So we were running it on, on, on bank loans all the time. And then you have droughts that hit and then you just almost at the edge of of losing it because of the financial drive in it. And you also need some luck, but persistence and dedication and believing in what you do and the love for what you do, that is what just kept us pushing. Um, and so piece by piece, we, we, we could also only buy always adjacent land because that is why we, we yeah, wanted to yeah, enlarge yeah. it. And, yeah, and piece by piece, Things fell in place, and I think it's just um, just because the love for what we were doing, the way of life, was there. And like I said, sometimes luck, because then the neighbor next door wanted to sell. We didn't have money, um, but Jan, in the beginning, he 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 just he was fearless. He knew he needed that piece of land, and he would go to the risk of, you know, he wouldn't even count on, you know, if that wouldn't part. It was a huge risk of losing everything, um, but he just pushed that way back in his mind. He just knew we are going to make it. Somehow we are going to make it. And so hard times and then also luck on, on certain things, you know. Um, and you got to be a little crazy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All the best yeah. people are. Yeah. They are. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. The, the, that, that one uh, funny story when a piece of land uh, came into the market and, and uh, he uh, well, basically uh, signed on it and then walked, uh, went to the bank and asked for the bank manager and the, the secretary said, well, they're in a meeting. So, well, where's the boardroom? And um uh, she said there, but you can't go in there. And well, he just walked in and opened the door and said to them, well, I just bought another piece of land. You guys better figure out how we're going to pay for it. <laughs> beautiful. That's beautiful. And yeah, because the lady in the, 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 the reception said, they are in a meeting. And he says, I know that meeting is about me. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he flung up. He's crazy guy and he keeps buying land. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just so funny. He said, when the guy... Uh, he, he was so flustered at the bank manager and he was so nervous and he, he I think the bank manager kind of believed in him but he was also nervous because going down in the lift and, and uh, but Jan was just he just he just went for it like a rhino yeah he just went for it and and there were times that were so worrisome I mean they were we didn't know where the money is going to come from and then especially you've just made your plans and you think, okay, this is this is the business. This is how we're going to shape it. And then also taking every opportunity. A film company came up and um, they needed in, we had five weeks and we only had three rooms at that time. And they needed, we needed to um, accommodate 60 people of that film crowd. And we made our sums. The additional rooms that we had to build would balance out what the firm would bring in would pay for the rooms when we started the project and then within five weeks we had two teams one at night and one during that day and that concrete mixer was going 
round and round and round. It was just, and the first, some of the rooms were washed away because it was rain season, and so the, so the foundation was washed away because our calculations wasn't right. We didn't have an engineer to, <laughs> to and so we just, and, and, and it was that persistent that, that, that pushed Jan to, to, and taking those opportunities that were so risky um, and just pushing through with them. And um, I remember we were on both teams. We we switched some one week. I was on the night team, and he was on the day team. And then we switched around, and he taught me in no time how to do the electricity. I did all the electricity on the on the roofs for them. And some of those cables we pulled out the other day, <laughs> they were still there. Um, it was just this force of both of us believing in, uh, but more so him, a little bit crazy. Um, which I joined into, and and you I, the crazy. yeah, and I think I think that was also a, a, a energy to him that he knew we were kind of partners in it, and and, and I believed in him, I believed in him, I believed that that, um, and in the beginning he he always said, you know, I don't have anything to lose, we can put so much into it and risk it because if we lose it, we lose it, that's okay, but as we grew and as we bought more land, then. That that calculating of risk became. Should be a little bit more. Yeah, we, we we were a little. We, we became. Suddenly, a you more had something to lose. Course. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. You you had this uh, really lovely phrase from when we've been interviewing for the film before about just start running and tie your laces later. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> and yes. I love that. You put on your shoes and then we tie the laces later. Yeah. yeah. It, 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 as I'm hearing you speak and just it's just the light is just going off of this just. There's the, the story behind the successful properties, the successful conservation places, the private areas outside of national parks and reserves, they don't just happen. Wildlife isn't just there by accident. It's an amazing amount of human effort. Sometimes it's a massive number of people that are involved in it. Um, sometimes it's two crazies that are just going it alone. <laughs> um, but the point is, is that Africa, wildlife living in a Africa outside of national parks and reserves, which is a small percentage of remaining habitat in sub-Saharan Africa, is there by unbelievable, unfathomable amounts of effort by, by individuals. Uh, it doesn't happen by accident. And when this existed as cattle farms, something else that I just would like you to expand on a bit more, um, there was not that many people employed here. Whereas if you walk through uh, the lodge now or up at the hunting camp, it's very obvious that there's a lot of people working here. Yes. <laughs> that means that local people have a reason for this place to exist and for the wildlife to be here. What's that change been like? Because you must, there must be families who were here from the very beginning, I would imagine. Yes, the families, some of them, uh, people working here, their grandparents worked for Jan already. And then my kind of generation that was the next level that still worked for us. And then the children of them went to school with Alex and some of them he employs today. And so there's a chain of, and I always say it's not just, it's not just our family business, it's a family business mm -hmm. because even our employees from the grandparents right to, down to the children and the grandchildren are now in the school. Because um, you have a school here as well. Yeah, we have a school here as well. And we always felt um, that, uh, coming first coming back to your first question, when it was all cattle land, you know, and, and some of the cattle land was, was not used, so there was not even no employment. It was just um, bought by an earlier generation, but the children didn't want to go on. And, and so when Jan came here, because he, he um, invented the capture method to capture large herds of game, and, and he didn't own the land and he never, he, it was the business of, of game capture, but he always wanted to own this land. But the lady who he belonged to, she didn't want to sell. But he just kept going. He just made it his base and he traded his, 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 the, the animals that he caught and uh, sort of uh, got them ready for the buyer and delivered. And so it was a base. And then at one stage she came up and, and he didn't have money. Um, but he said, I'm going to buy it. Um, so that was the beginning. So with that, also developing and then also taking all up all the opportunities. Obviously, first was the game capture um, was the first business. Then it came hunting because with the um, herds, like I just explained now, there was male animals in excess that he, that the buyer didn't want to buy. Um, so 
he started immediately getting into the trophy hunting side. Um, and that was revenue for more land, exactly. more nature conservation. Yeah, yeah, more species to be reintroduced onto the land. Because, because there was a lot of stuff that was missing. Yeah, a lot of... should have been here. And when we when, when he started, or we started on the cattle land, like I said, there was maybe four species. We are now at 35 species, all brought back onto the land. Um, and it, it, on the cattle land, like either no employment or maybe three people employed. So with the hunting business, with the game capture, first of all, you need you needed a big group of people to help. Um, then came the hunting. You employed different people. Um, also, you needed to specialize a little bit. You needed to to um, uh, um, train them up in a different field. And with everything, then came the tourism side because we had to build all those rooms for, first for the film company, and then we had the rooms. Okay, what are we doing now? Started the tourism side because we, and so with tourism is very labor intensive, um, and so obviously that attracted, that started the, the way more employment than than what was here, and we always felt that, or maybe it it, it came naturally. Is um, today we speak a lot about human wildlife conflict, which happens on the borders of parks and on the outside of a on the perimeter of conservation areas. Um, but to us, it was a normal. It was almost like a, like a natural thing that we we have to keep our social structure or the people structure, the human structure, right in the middle. The nucleus has to be healthy, and how do you keep it healthy? You have to have happy employment, happy employees. You have to have loyal employees. Their energy. You need the energy to make this this engine work. Um, we cannot do it without our team. You so, described it to me once as the human wildlife relationship. Exactly. Whereas we always talk about the human wildlife conflict, yeah. which is a very negative yeah. way. I mean, human wildlife relationship can be a negative one, but if that's how we're viewing it, this relationship exactly. between humans and wildlife, it has the opportunity to be positive. Yes. Rather than it, human wildlife conflict can only be one thing. It can only be negative. Yeah. So when I, I remember when you said that to me, it was when we were, we were, we were shooting a scene in the plane a few weeks ago when I was here, and I thought, oh, that, is, right, that yeah. is brilliant. Yeah. That's a really brilliant phrase. Yeah, and if you fuel that human wildlife relationship the right way, you you give it the right energy, um, and that is by by employees feeling that they they are socially uplifted, feeling that the children are educated, feeling that suddenly the children we were speaking about the the women that need education, and seeing those women go out and 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 earning a degree and coming back, and those siblings suddenly. That is so much positive energy that that the people feel or the families feel that they have so much loyalty towards us. And also on the medical side, you know, we have a pediatrician coming in every month, checking up on all the children, um, supplying the medicines which are not available to them and giving them good medicines. Um, they've realized that this is, I have to protect this area. All this wildlife, all this, and this, because that, that feeds me, that feeds my family, and so I think that came naturally with us. But um, thinking about it and putting it in words and thinking back and the reward, the reward that comes now to it, um, also you know some people that go through medical issues, it's a big problem to them, and we can solve it quickly. Um, you 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 uh, you get your loyalty back into your community, and then it's a positive human wildlife relationship. Alex, when you look at um, this place that you now exist in, <laughs> and I see you running around um, every day fixing problems that you didn't know were there yesterday, and you look to the future, you have two amazing kids. What are your concerns about the future of this reserve here? Well, a big one, of course, is is, is um, you know the the issue of rhino poaching and and, and uh, you know losing rhino, and then another big worry is always what the future holds climate wise. Um, you know, with droughts being a big big part of Namibia, um, and it's I think it's it's hard to plan for the future, so you just take it day by day and and, and challenge by challenge. But I, I think in a bigger picture. Um, you know, like my mom just said, uh, the, the, the fueling that human wildlife relationship. If we can can grow that, you know, if we can if we can get the people in Africa 
to to want to keep wildlife alive you know if they can can protect and feed their families by coexisting with wildlife and 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 uh, you know deriving an income off of wildlife so they can put food on their table for their kids then they're going to want to have wildlife around i see you know there there's examples like uh, kenya um where people don't have any benefit of from wildlife um you know where where kenya has uh, lost 80 percent of their wildlife um you know and in contrast to that namibia where people can derive an income from wildlife 80 percent of wildlife in namibia is on privately owned land um, and if we can can grow that and get local communities to benefit from wildlife they'll want to keep wildlife around and we didn't have a chance to go to the, the butchery today, but I know that's something you want to show John before he leaves. That to me is quite a, a, an additional fascinating take on it because we, we know that there's a lot of people on the planet. We know that we have to feed these people. For the vast majority of people eat meat. You're producing an amazing amount of protein off this land at the same time as all of these other operational activities that put economic revenue into sustaining the place. And this is directly feeding people from a sustainable surplus of wild game here. Why is that important? Um, it's it's uh, well, uh, like you said, you know, most people eat meat. We need protein to survive, and so our butchery here, on average, we produce about thirty six tons of meat from naturally harvested animals. And you know, if we, we look we look at a that per year, yeah, and and we look at a world where our human population is just exploding, and you know we need sources of protein, and yet we keep destroying natural habitat to produce that protein. You know, we we, we build huge feedlots for for beef. We, um, you know, the, the plow everything to bits to plant soybeans for tofu, and yet here we have a model where we can produce so much protein from animals that have evolved over millions of years to naturally occur in this habitat. So we're not changing the habitat, we're not destroying the habitat or the environment, and yet we can still produce the protein. You're actually so, restoring, what, what you've actually done is restore yeah, an ecosystem exactly. here, and you've got sustainable often. Exactly. And so when you look at protein production, the, the, the meat we harvest here, the meat coming off of a springbuck here, to me, is carbon neutral where any other form of protein production, be it um, soybeans or beef, is all, all has a big carbon footprint. What is the, that's interesting, the, the, the amount of the volume out of 80,000 acres you're producing 36 tons. If you put a monetary amount of, if someone had to go buy that to consume it all, you know, um, what would the, what's the, what's the, imp, what's the output? Of that, it'd be, do some quick maths, man. yeah, it'd be really interesting <laughs> um, to to see because that you have to factor that into it. Not not only the tourism side of of it, whether it be the consumptive and non-consumptive, but the but the fiscal output yeah. of protein. So if we if we work on a pretty low estimate. Um, just just of the the, the raw meat value yeah, not so not um, having done any value adding to the meat mm -hmm. um, we're looking at about hundred and fifty thousand dollars that's amazing a year that's amazing just out of the meat yeah at the ground level so to speak yeah wow. and that, that could be f once you actually turn that into stuff that could be four or five times as much yeah. mm -hmm. I'm thinking about our but how much the markup is in a butcher at home. Well, I, yeah, yeah. I, I go to a store and buy a steak and I'm paying 18 bucks for a steak then yeah. I still have to cook yeah <laughs> and, and and so I, I did a rough calculation if you take a, a standard size cattle farm in, in, in Namibia which is about 10,000 acres um, and you stock it solely with wildebeest and giraffe and you do only you basically only do harvesting for meat you could do this get the same amount out as you do with cattle and there is no impact on the environment because those are naturally occurring animals mm -hmm. And you don't have all the uh, the work that you do that you'd put into injecting cattle and, and uh, dipping them and they keeping look them. After themselves yeah. because Higher. they belong here. Yeah, yeah. That's, so that's crazy. Higher net, yeah, and it's more climactic resistant. Yeah, mm. you get those extreme waves. Yeah. And you got your natural biosphere um, utilization. 
because they're the, all browsing. Or yeah, because with the levels. cattle, obviously they just use one as uh, one certain you know just grazing, and that's where you have all your the other imbalances coming in, uh, bush encroachment, um, and then you have you know you you bringing in like pe pesticides or you're bringing in like the cattle dip or something you know you bring all that stuff in which needs to be produced somewhere mm -hmm. um where if you have your natural wildebeest and impala or springbok even on that same piece of land if you have just various different biospheres that are being being browsed and grazed on mm -hmm. it stays the way it's 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 you know natural we, we, we see it here with our properties, is, is properties that we've added on that were cattle land, they're usually en encroached by a lot of bush, so very, very thick bush because cattle would just, um, you know, graze on the grass and there's nothing that would, would browse. So, so you're the, actually losing grass, eventually do you lose the grass yeah. from the overgrazing? Yeah, yeah, so, and and then what typically happens on, on a lot of cattle farms is that they then use herbicides to kill all the bush. Um, and then what we see is over the years, it does take a long period of time, but you see it opening up naturally again because you have all the different species grade all the different or graze all the different levels of, of bush and grass. Mm -hmm. And wetlands begin to form too, where I think, you know, the, I, I see this with the American prairie and the bison being reintroduced and cattle being removed and photographs of an area of a, of a little bit, bit of a dip. When you say wetlands, meaning you know, you, all of a sudden it has vegetation around it, cattails, waterfowl starts pre producing there. You've got beavers that come in and start to create dams, and you know the whole ecology changes. And that's that's in half a, less than half a decade when you've got wild game versus livestock. It can be done. It can. I mean, be done, the, this yeah. picture that you just painted here. Yeah. It can be done. It, it requires a mind shift in what we're expecting as an offtake, because this is wild animals. I think there's, there's definitely a barrier in the vast majority of people's mind. There's not very many people eating wild game. Like we have a massive access to wild game because we have a get wild game market in the UK and yet not a lot of people are eating it. And yet it's very accessible. In some cases, vastly cheaper than buying you know, beef or lamb or maybe not chicken. Because Why are they not eating it? <clears throat> there isn't a taste for it. But do you think a lot of that's influenced by the power of the beef lobby or the... Probably. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the amount there of is a spent. lot of money from government historically that has gone into supporting farmers. <clears throat> Rightly so in many cases. We need to feed the population. But that has also come alongside the marketing efforts to sell those products in the first place. Um, I think the other element of it is that game meat generally speaking, also has an association with hunting. And that, generally speaking, has a negative connotation. And so there's definitely a barrier there that exists for people, which is a shame. Like we should be eating way more venison. It's pretty much 90% of my diet at home is from different species of deer. It's there and very accessible to people and it would be a lot cheaper if people bought that so so all of your listeners out there are eating venison right well i mean they've heard <laughs> me talk about it enough <laughs> but probably prob probably not and i think the other aspect of that is accessibility because yes i say it's there i know that it's going through the game dealers that's not where your average consumer can buy from that's a wholesaler that is then distributing to restaurants or shipping it out to Europe or wherever it might be. Most supermarkets where your average busy person is only going to the one shop once a week because that's all the time they have to go and ship it, it has to be there. And the supermarkets have to make it affordable because this is the problem that I've seen just quite recently in some, um, some filming that I've been doing for another project, is that I speak to the game dealer and they say that they're getting a hard time from the producers. So that's the hunters, particularly in the uplands of Scotland, because they're not being, they can't pay them very much for the carcass. That's the, the product that they're getting as the game dealer. So carcass skin on per pound. So they're saying, you should be paying us more. And they're like, well, yeah, I'd love to pay you more, but the people buying it from us are not paying us more. So we can't pay you more because we still have to make a margin to distribute it. Then eventually when it gets into the supermarket, it's more expensive than the beef because someone along the line is making massive markups on it. And it's not the person producing it, and it's not the game dealer distributing it. That's in the hands of the supermarket. So for some reason that I don't really fully understand, 
there isn't the incentive there, there, or maybe it's just that there isn't the volume, because there's never going to be as much volume of that as there is of mass-produced agricultural products, for them to put it on their shops at a price point that makes it comparable and accessible to people. If you're listening to this, and particularly if you live in rural communities, go speak to your local butcher, because they should be able to have access to it in, 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 a, in a way and at a price point that isn't the crazy supermarket prices, but it sometimes requires a little Ca bit caviar of caviar prices. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. But it, that's, it's, I suppose that's an education thing as well. And there has to be a will to do it. And another thing that we discovered recently is, we thought, well, why are more people not taking venison? And we just discovered two weeks ago, speaking to um, some of the producers of it, that the venison association, I'm talking in Scotland, that is producing something like a hundred and 20,000 deer a year into the food chain. This is just red deer. Their marketing budget is 15,000 pounds, <laughs> so $20,000. And I said to them, you might as well dig a hole in your garden and bury your 15,000 pounds because it's completely insignificant as a, marketing um, as a marketing budget for anything, actually, if you're being serious about something. And so there's another problem. We have to be invested in taking these wild products, which if managed right, can do the most brilliant things for the land that we all covet so preciously. And we all want to see it return to like, like where we're sitting right now, not just barren and where cattle, where you're seeing species flourish. And it is possible, but the end consumer also has to want it, I think. Mm. I think also a lot of the end consumers are kind of detached from the reality of where their food comes from. Mm -hmm. And and we've seen it here with discussions on, on the export of, of game meat to Europe, mm -hmm. where here we have a season when you can harvest game meat or when culling operations can be done. And then in that season, of course, you have a huge volume of meat coming onto the market. But when you talk to the, the, the wholesalers in Europe, they want contracts where you can deliver monthly. And as soon as you say, well, out of season, you know, it's either we're storing it for a long period or, you know, it'll, we'll, we can deliver. They, they don't want that because they want everything packaged nicely and um, they want to be able to sell it to, you know, to retail it they want consistency. consistently. Um, but that's because the end user wants that consistency of wanting, if he thinks about having a steak this morning, he wants to go into a supermarket this afternoon and be able to buy a steak. Because, and, and I think that's where the, just the whole detachment of the whole f you know, food chain of where your, your meat comes from is, is, you know, people don't think as far as where it gets produced. How does it get here? What's the, um, you know, the, the, the shipping and then the transport? They want it now if they're thinking about it now. And um, it's, 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 the human race has become too, too set on luxury, on, uh, on immediate yeah. gratification, exactly. And, and it is a luxury to eat things out of season. <laughs> We can have we can buy strawberries all year round. It's ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, I love my raspberries in January. I love them. Yeah. <laughs> this has been an incredible conversation, which I know could go on deep into the night and past dinner. Uh, but I suppose at some point we have to draw it to a close, and it's just an excuse to do it another time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's been uh, fun to be. You know, I've listened to your podcast before. This is my first podcast. Which I'm no way. With, with How you. is John Banovich no, not with done you. a podcast? With, no, I've done podcasts. I've oh, done podcasts. Oh, but, first with me. With I you. Was say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, with no, you. It is. And so it's exciting to be actually on the inside instead of uh, having you know it playing in my studio, hearing your voice in my studio. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're you're more than welcome. It's a pleasure to have you on. And uh, I actually, despite all the time that I spent with Annette in the last couple of years filming with her, she hasn't, she's managed to escape a podcast Has as she? well. So yeah. the only way that I was able to get on the podcast <laughs> was to say that John said that Alex and Annette need to be on a podcast today. So that's, that's how beautiful. I managed to pull that one off. <laughs> well, so thank you to all no, of you. I was still backpedaling. Yeah, you were backpedaling, but I didn't let you out of it this time. <laughs> So I really appreciate your time, all of you, and all of your insights and all of the work that everybody does. It's making a difference on the ground. Yeah, and I, I want to say to both uh, Alex and, and Annette, um, you're, you're, you're unsung heroes. I mean, what you, you, know, you chose this 
life of, of um, challenge, at this challenging life, you could easily exit from it should you choose to. Uh, you're very smart people. You could you know, accomplish great things in, in a normal civil society, but you chose this life of, uh, of you know, challenging uh, uh, landscape, so to speak, and you're, you're protecting a species that is near and dear to my heart and I know is, your, is, is near and dear to yours. So um, I applaud you on behalf of, of humanity, the human race. <laughs> we thank you for uh, doing what you do and, and staying in the game and your uh, un, unwavering resolve. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And we appreciate the energy like that, which comes from your side again to, you know, to stand with us and, 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 and fight this course to we will win. <laughs> it takes, it and takes I think Alex and the new generation and his wife, Carola, um, it's an amazing energy that that comes, you know, that that we all as a family take it on. You know, um, we 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 all three have such strong points. I always say we are like a triangle. Everyone got the strength on the side and sticking together, overlapping. We find the energy and the strength and everything to push through and make it work and just a supermodel. Awesome. Let's go get some of those uh, Rhino and get the uh, tracking devices let's, in them. Let's get it done. Yeah. Let's, hope we re let's hope that everybody's uh, recorded. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be great at this point. Thanks, Byron. <laughs> Thank you, Byron.